All right, good morning. Uh, this is December 15th. I am Jason Tripp. This is the main service here. I apologize that I sound uh, horrible, um, but I've been under the weather for the last couple weeks, and I think I'm rounding the curve here. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Romans, chapter number 8. I think I know everybody here except for Ryan's girlfriend. No. Oh, oh, oh yeah. sorry. <laughs> sorry. I like to do that. Uh, <laughs> what is your name? Kelsey, nice to meet you, Kelsey. Awesome. I had to just do that to Ryan just to make him feel welcome. So, awesome. Well, Romans chapter eight, please, if you if you're there. <clears throat> so we've been talking about the the, the practicality of, of what these this this good works that everybody talks about so much, especially down the Christmas season. Everybody's real hospitable. Everywhere I go, they're asking me to round up. Have you noticed that? Oh, can you mind rounding up? What, what is this going to? Just, just round it up. How many, how many cents? Like 23 cents? Okay, just round it up. You don't even know where this money is going. But during the Christmas time, what do they capitalize on? They capitalize on everybody's goodwill toward man and just say, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll do good works. And it's easy how that goes. Come January 1, round up. No, I don't have any money. I, I just spent it all at Christmas time. Everybody's going to be reeling from the, the, the credit card bills that are coming in. And it's also a really good, good, this is a complete side point. If you're ever looking for something, you know, January on eBay and Craigslist, lots of good stuff gets posted on there because people are trying to make that credit card payment. So just, just as a note. But the good works that people are experiencing uh, th now is, is, is more so because of the holiday spirit. It gets people in this particular mood. Do you ever notice that, that, that there's just a mood of, of joyousness and, and hospitality and whatever it is? I have a couple clients that, that do a, a bunch of different types of uh, altruistic activities, and I noticed that while they do all this, this good activity, there's really a, a, a side benefit, whether it be a tax benefit, a financial benefit, whether it be a publicity or a marketing benefit. And I really was thinking, where, where is the good then? Are they really, is anybody actually doing any good work at all? Or is this all just a disguise to somehow, you know, when Christ is in, in the scripture and, uh, and, and he talks about giving, he says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, right? What is the concept behind that? It's just like, you're just, you're doing it. They, they have an example that when they were giving, they were, sl you know, slamming money into the, into the pail or into the bin to make it known that they could hear how much money the people were giving, right? So he, all, he says in there, well, you have your reward. In other words, that was the reward of what they got. So what I'm going to tell you is that the good works that we do today, there is a reward for them when they are done through Christ Jesus. So what that means is that God, who began the good work in you, as Philippians 1 says, he begins that good work in you, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now you should take, take a step back and look at your life and go, what type of things has, has, has God been doing in my life? And it's pretty interesting. If you actually really take a step back and start to really look at it, you'll go, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of things that have been occurring in, in, in my life that are a result of a spiritual mindset that I possess about who God is, what our purpose in life is, what our motivation is. And so I want to make it clear that good works in the life of a believer should be so paramount that people look at you and they call you, as Paul says, a peculiar people zealous of good works. So let me, let me preface that by saying a peculiar people means that the majority of the world would not be a peculiar people. In other words, they're doing a good work with the reward already being received, that is the marketing benefit, the taxation benefit, the financial benefit, the accolade, the pat, the pat on the back, the attaboy, whatever it might be. So now you really go, well, hold on. If I possess a flesh, how do I ever know whether or not what I'm, what I'm quote unquote, being done in my body, is Christ doing the work or not? Is that a valid question? Right? What do you think the answer to that is? How, how do you know? Well, number one, the, just, the, just the thought of that <coughs> indicates that you do care about whether or not it's Christ or not. So it's probably a good indication of your motivation, right? The motivation should always be to glorify God, right? So when Paul says, you know, when I, when I came and I preached to you, I didn't ask any money from you. I didn't want to create any problems. That, 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 that I gave you the gospel freely without charge, that, it be not, that there's no blame here that you could look at me and say I tried to do anything deceitful. So that's that living honesty before God and men. In Romans chapter 7, he says that, there's, that there is a constant war 
inside of, of, of you, if you took in Romans chapter 7, and verse number 23, <clears throat> and this is where we're going to pick up, and then we're going to get into Romans 8. In that war that, that is accomplishing inside of your, your you is the law of your mind, which tries to bring you into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. I'm going to read it again. He says, I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. This is the law that the majority of the world lives under, which is they're going to do lots of good so that somehow in the good that they do, God will be happy with them. I spent two hours this week talking to the guy that's been working on my bathroom, okay? The guy's working on my bathroom, and he's been working on my bathroom for like two months, okay? He said it was going to get done in like two weeks, you know? It's typical, right? Like, yeah, your bathroom, two weeks. Yeah, okay, I've been here before. Uh, multiply that times four. He kind of got mad at me when I said it to him. He says, no, 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 no. I get my stuff done when I say I'm going to get it done. And I said, and I did, I'm just kind of joking. I said, okay, so 100 bucks a day every day, you're not going to get it done? And he's like, well, you know, I'm like, yeah, okay, I know. So, of course, he's not going to do that. So he ends up having a stroke. This guy is a full-blown TIA. He's 38 years old. I mean, the whole, like, you know, goes to the hospital, goes to the ER, can't, you know, function half of his face. His body can't walk. His wife ca carries and drags him in there. Um, so... He had been in the hospital for about a month, and he finally is out, and I, he's coming to work. And I said, why are you working? Why are you here? He goes, what do you mean? What else am I going to do? I said, you just had a stroke. And he says, yeah, I know. And I says, so you have a stroke. What are, what are you thinking about? So I talked for three hour, two, about two hours with the guy, and I asked him a couple questions. I said, let me ask you a serious question. You're sitting there, and you have the stroke. What's going through your mind? And he says, you know what's going through my mind? And I said, yeah, I want to know. He says, well, I have an account with $250,000, and my wife doesn't know about it, and she isn't in the pastors for it, and she doesn't even, who, is she ever going to get that? How is she going to take care of the kids? How she, you know? So I said, okay, so you're thinking about some other people. I said, that's good, but what else were you thinking about? I said, do you think about where you go, what happens? And he's like, well, you know, I've been through a lot of stuff in my life. And I said, okay, t tell me about it. What, tell me about this stuff in your life that brought you to what you thought about. He goes, well, I did think about where I go. And I said, well, where did you think you go? And he, he you know, didn't really want to answer the question. It was very kind of, and one of the first things out of his mouth was this. You know, I've, I've had a lot of stuff happen in my life. I said, okay, what kind of stuff, man? What kind of things? He says, well, you know, I've had, uh, I've been hooked on drugs. I said, okay. He says, I've been homeless. Yeah. Been in jail. Okay. And I said, so what did you learn from all that? <laughs> and he's like, well, you know, it's really weird that you're having this discussion with me. I said, why is it really weird? He goes, because I, I, I just feel like it's kind of strange. What's strange about the discussion? I said, I, is this a normal discussion? You just had a stroke. I'm asking you about it. I'm trying to get your opinion upon you're sitting there almost dying, and now you're showing up at work to, to do my, my bathroom, of all things? I think I'd have my priorities. I'd be like, my bathroom, who cares? Right? Let's do other. I got other things in life. <coughs> and he says, well, you know, I've learned that, you know, it's, you, you got to be good. I said, really? So what, you think you're good? He goes, well, yeah. And I said, were you good? And he goes, well, no. I mean, I had, a, I had all kinds of issues. I was doing drugs and selling drugs. And, you know, I was in, I was in jail and in and out of this and that. And my parents and my dad beat me. And blah, blah. You know, he's, he's, just, he's just going through his whole list of his whole things about his life. And I said, okay, I understand. You've had, you've had, quite, a, you've had quite the upbringing, way, way worse than mine. I mean, I've, I've had some stuff and nothing like you've gone through. And I asked him, what do you think the good is that you're doing? He goes, well, I think that there's that there's an obligation to do good. And this was like, I'm like, are you really? God, are you just giving me this on a platter right here to give for, for my sermon uh, illustration? And I, and I asked a guy, I said, well, what is the good? What are you doing? He goes, well, I do my work. I do it honestly. I said, okay, isn't that a given? Shouldn't you just, that'd be a, isn't that what everybody does? So what's the good? And he, I was not letting him go away from it. He didn't like it. He kept going to something else, come back. Go to something else, come back. And I keep asking him, okay, so back to that good. What type of good do you have before God? What type of good did you do? And he's like, well, you know, I, I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> good. I got you to a point where you kind of acknowledge that. He says, you know, it's weird that you're having this discussion with me because I've only had a handful of people ever do this. And I said, well, I care. And, I, and, you know, I don't really know you that much, but you've been in my house for the last, you know, couple weeks working on this project. So, and I heard that you, you had the stroke, and I was concerned about you. And he said, well, there's only one other person that's ever done that. And I said, who's that? He goes, it was my youth pastor when I was a little kid, when I was like 17, 18 years old. 
And I said, okay, well, tell me about that incident. What happened? He goes, well, I was, the youth pastor was there, and I was in jail, and my parents didn't care, and, you know, I was 17, 18 years old, and whatever, and he, he told me the whole story, and I'm just like, what? It's craziness. So I just said, okay. And the youth pastor shows up, and he says, I'm going to bail you out. And he goes, why? And he goes, well, who else do you have? And I go, well, why did that youth pastor do that? And he goes, I don't know. I said, why do you think I'm talking to you today about this? And he's like, I don't know. I said, well, I can tell you why. So we get into the, we get into the gospel. I tell him that, you know, about the forgiveness that is obtained through Christ. I explain to him the grace of the gospel. And then I started to outlay some of the good that he's doing. I said, you know, the good that you're doing is, is not righteousness. It is, it is not done through Christ Jesus. The good that you're doing is just you, you want to do good because you know that you have a conscience before God and that, that you unfortunately in this conscience have been offending God and you're trying to make amends. Mm-hmm. And, and despite how much you might try to make the amends and make God happy, Unfortunately, the only way that you can please God is not in your flesh, but in the spirit, and that is to, to believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins. And he really looked at me, and, you know, it's, it's amazing how people, you can say something right to their face, and then they just round about, talk about something completely different, like, and I, I keep coming back to it, keep coming back to it. So two hours, about an hour and 40 minutes into it, one of my guys comes to pick up some, some products from my house for a job he's doing. He walks in the front door, and we're, like, in the, in the heat of the discussion of it, and he just walks in like this, does this, and just goes, yeah, I'll let you guys get, you keep going at it. He leaves, comes back out, and he goes, after it, my, the guy left, he goes, man, that was, you guys were getting into it. I said, well, yeah, we just giving him the gospel. I said, you're sitting there, and what do you think happens? You're sitting there. You, you've, you're literally in a hospital bed. You're having a, you can't even function. You don't even know you're having a stroke. You have no idea what's happening to you. Uh, the doctors are, you know, they're putting IVs in you. You, you can't talk. You're going, that's what he said. He couldn't talk. He goes, I couldn't give, even if I wanted to give her the passwords, what am I going to do? He says, I just couldn't do anything. I'm going, this is, this is crazy. So <clears throat> I left him with this. I said, you know, you owe it to yourself to spend tonight and tomorrow and the rest of your life until you die thinking about where you're going to spend eternity. And I, I gave you this answer. He goes, well, I think that, that all things happen for a reason. And I said, okay, if all things happen for a reason, what's the reason for me talking to you about this today? I said, I can tell you the reason. And he really, he didn't like it, so the, the, the girl who actually introduced me to this guy, she's married to a pastor, and I told them the same story, and they're like, wow, that's awesome, We're gonna, we'll follow up with him. But that is very common, that people have a concept of human good, that they're going to do something good. We have no problem doing it. As Paul says, we should be a people zealous of good works. The whole purpose of, of, of being saved is unto good works that God has before ordained, that we should walk in them. The purpose of the scripture is that every man may be what? All scriptures given by inspiration of God is Paul for doctrine, for proof, for correction, instruction, righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay? It's easy to do that in in the in the Christmas time, but I want to encourage you guys that during this Christmas time, we have so many opportunities to give people the gospel, it's ridiculous. They just keep popping up. Like, oh, baby Jesus, who is that? <laughs> Ask questions. Just say who is that? What do you think that is? What do you think about Jesus? And you might be surprised. People are like, well, I don't know. Do you think he might be the son of God? It's a pretty interesting story, isn't it? When you're talking about good works here, I want to make sure that you understand that God does care about good works, but you cannot do any good works or anything good to get yourself to heaven. I don't care how hard you try. I don't care how many good things you end up doing. You will still fall short of the glory of God. Paul says, for all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. That glory is perfect, absolute righteousness. Something we don't possess intrinsically. We must get it from the one and only source that is Christ Jesus. There's a lot of imitators out there, but there's only one Jesus Christ that's going to give you righteousness freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, as Paul here in Romans chapter 7 says, I want to make it clear that you should be thinking in your mind, well, what is the law of my mind that is warring against the, the, the law in my members? The law in your members is just, let's do sin. We love sin. My body loves sin. Sin, 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 sin. That's the law of your members. The law of your mind says, sin, not good. Sin, contrary to God. Why do you do sin? Well, let me read you this verse. Paul says in verse number 18, 
He says, for I know that in me, then he makes a, a parenthesis, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Stop. Think about it. What? Paul was an individual who was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a person that had a, a very high uh, position within the Jewish religion. He, he was exceedingly zealous of the law and the traditions of his fathers. He was an individual who persecuted the church. He was a murderer. He was a blasphemer. He was an idolater. And he makes this statement here after his conversion that he says, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. This is how you have to look when you're doing your good, when you are letting Christ work his life through you, you stop and say, it's not me, it is Christ. So you sit there and say, it is not me. In other words, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Because for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Your flesh does not have the ability to perform the good. This is where I think a lot of people still get confused. They're confused because they go, well, you're telling me I don't have to do good works in my flesh, but that good works will come. How, how, how do they, where does it happen? Paul says in the book of First Thessalonians <clears throat> that the word of God will effectually work in you that believe. The process that God wants you to go through, we're going to look here in the book of Ephesians, is that you are taught, he says, you have not so learned Christ. You are instructed you have to be explained this concept. It doesn't come naturally. And then you're going to live a life, as we're going to read in just a minute, we're going to pick up here in Romans 8 where we left last week, a life that is led by the Spirit, which that always gets people real weird. You can just read commentaries on what people think that led by the Spirit means, and you go, what is this, mysticism? <coughs> is, is this some, what, what are you getting into right now? Is this the horoscope? I, I think I told you guys that joking story that I was, in the keys with one of my clients and the guy tells me you know are you a capricorn or are you a pisces and i'm like you know it's amazing that these guys believe this kind of stuff but they won't believe the gospel right you guys are believing all kinds of weird horoscope stuff but i try to give you the gospel and you just you just throw it away i want to pick up where we finished last week in romans chapter 8 to discuss this issue of the good works <clears throat> and what is in you Paul says again in 8 verse 18, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Go down to verse number uh, 5 of chapter 8. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. You can put that mind word in there again. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit do mind the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. This is going to become incredibly important as you read these next verses. He says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Do you still possess a carnal mind? Yes. Do you realize how much the church fails so much to explain this to people and they wonder why they're not, they don't ever think they're saved, they have eternal life? Well, if they, have, if they even believe the gospel, it's because they've never been told that in their body, in their life, that they're going to exist on this earth, that they're going to have a constant struggle, a constant war. It's never going to stop. So you have to just go, okay, if that's the way it is, then what do I do? There's a song, it's actually, it's called Make War, and the younger kids would like it because it's by a guy named Tadashi, and it's actually really good song. Uh, it's about that whole concept of just making war on a daily basis against, he's like, I make war against this, make war against this, make war against this, and he talks about the, the armor of God. The enmity that is against God, the carnal mind, it says here that it is not subject to the law of God, neither can be, because it's, it's not possible for you and your flesh to do anything under the law except for to be condemned by it. So it, the subjectivity to it is you're condemned to it. You can sit there all day and try to do it, try to perform it, not possible. So then, as he says, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So if we're just working through some basic logic, you have a flesh, 
Uh, Paul says it here in 18 of chapter 7, that is in that, that your flesh dwells no good thing, okay? That this flesh here, that it cannot please God. So how then do we please God? If you were to ask this guy, Eric, that I just was talking to, he would say, I'm going to please God by doing the good works that I do. And then when I get down and ask him, what good works did you do? He just tells me a bunch of nothing. I said, I'm still looking for the good works that you're doing. Well, you know, I don't kill people. <laughs> okay. That's just refraining from doing bad behavior, okay? Tell me the good works you're doing. And it's like, it's hilarious. Like, you're telling me you're going to do all these works to, to be happy. I mean, so you can have a peace with God or you, can, you and God can be okay. But then at the same time, you can't really tell me any good works you do. Well, I provide for my family. I said, yeah, I think that's just a given. Don't you have to provide for your family? And you just wonder, you go, have you ever really given this much thought? I ended up asking that. I said, how much have you thought about this? <clears throat> In this next verse, he says, so the inner of the flesh cannot please God. This next verse is what's the, the, the complete kicker of all the verses. It's the verse that you just go, well, wait, what? I, I am though, right? No, you're not. He says this, but ye are not in the flesh. I, sh I should have like little memes up here for all the little... My, the kids would like this one. You know the little meme where the guy has all the little question marks on his head and he goes like this? Yeah, it's basically like that. The little meme. And you're just like, wait, what? I don't understand what you're talking about, Paul. How then am I How then am I not in the flesh? I don't understand that. I'm, I have a flesh right here. It's, it's sitting here. I can see it. I can, I can live in it. How then? Because he says this. He goes, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, here's the conditioner. Here's the conditioner. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Okay. Who here, who here possesses the spirit of God that dwells in you? Yes? Yes? How? How do you know? How do you know? How does he enter into your life? At what, at what point does that occur? Faith in what? In the gospel. And who Christ is. Ephesians 1.13, in whom you have trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, after that you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's the earnest of our inheritance. It's the down payment. It's the seal. Now, if you read this, the problem that we run into, I'm, I'm going to explain this. This is, this is the, uh, Sandy and I were just talking, you know, the, the difficult part sometimes you, you make a statement and you go, yeah, easier said than done right? You ever heard that one? Easier said than done. That's kind of where I get with this because people will go, <clears throat> well, I don't feel this way. It, the scripture never says you have to feel a specific way about it. And, and actually quite the contrary, you might feel the exact opposite. But what I want to tell you is that there is a faith aspect to believing that this verse means what it says. And that any thought that enters your mind that is counter to that is obviously contrary to scripture and is not from God. So when you read this passage and he says, ye are not in the flesh, the answer is you are not in the flesh because God does not see you in the flesh. You do not work in the flesh. Though we, though we are in the flesh, we are not in the flesh. And you go, come on, why is this guy? It's not complicated. It's the position that you have before God is not in the flesh. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. <clears throat> now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Very important point. If you do not possess the Spirit of Christ, you're none of his. You are not his. You are not a possessory of God. Now, this possession aspect of God is what he says right here. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Let's just read that again. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, clearly. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. <clears throat> if you remember, he started all this in verse number six or five to say that they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. So if you just mind the things of the flesh all day, I'm going to tell you what, your existence is going to be real miserable. You're going to have a real miserable life. You want to know how to get real depressed real fast? Start living in the flesh. Because you know what you'll do? You go, well, this is pointless. Well, that's pointless. That's a waste of time. Why am I doing this? There's no investment in eternity in that. I guess we all just eat, sleep, drink, tomorrow we die? Is that how it goes? 
That's how the majority of life lives, right? So that verse of minding the things of the flesh is how he's trying to tell you how to process this information, that you do not need to be carnally minded because if you stay in a carnal mindset your whole life, it's just going to be an ending of death. If you have a spiritually mindset your whole life, it's going to be life and peace. So if he says, if Christ be in you, the body is dead, the body is dead because the sin that exists in your body is going to kill you one way or the other. We ain't escaping it. You know, Frank probably uses the joke all the time. Well, two things in life that are certain, death and taxes. Right? That's the typical accountant phrase. And you're like, yeah, yeah, we know. We're just trying to figure out ways to avoid paying the taxes. They never ask you. Well, maybe they do. They never ask you how to avoid the death. Right? And if Christ be in you, the body is dead. Then he says this. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. See, the life that you get is the, the proof of the life that you get is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the proof of the righteousness that you, that you possess and that God, in his punishment on Christ for the wrongdoing of you and the entire world, the sin, is then wiped clean because it is paid. It wasn't just like God just forgot about it and said, ah, no big deal. He actually said, no, it is sufficient. It is paid your debts cleared, the wages of sin for you is no longer death. I now give to you the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I mean, who doesn't get happy about that? You got something wrong in your head if that doesn't make you happy. Because I go through a lot of stuff in my life and I just go, oh, this is this at the end of the day, this is what we're banking on, right? So if he be if if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. See, what people don't realize is they actually are all dead. The world is dead. They're dead in trespasses and in sins. They don't possess life. They think they have a life. And so this is what I'm really going to get to. This is the hard part because when Paul says in the next couple of verses, being led by the Spirit, that, 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 the, that, the, uh, that our Spirit itself bears witness with, with the Spirit, that we are the child. And then people get weird, like, how does that work? I'm going to explain to you that there is a degree of relief, if you would, that you can experience. Just think about it. You're forgiven. Oh, man. Could you imagine if you owed somebody $100,000 and all of a sudden they walked up to you and say, you know what? Paid. It's forgiven. You go, how would you feel? Would you have a sense of relief? There'd be a massive sense of relief off of you. And that's what we're trying to explain in the gospel, that there is a relief that you experience Paul says that they live their whole life in fear of death. They live their whole life in fear of death. I'm just, just telling Sandy, you know, I've been on the boat and I had something happen with my arm and I was like, I, I had this little pinched nerve thing going and it will like twinge and all of a sudden like, you know, the like crazy shooting down my arm and all things happen and I just make the joke, oh, this is it, I'm going to see Jesus. And I say it like that and said, I'm dying. Or, uh, you know, I'm going to heaven. I like to make it really clear. I'm going to see Jesus. And in doing that, you watch how some my friends get weird. They, my, my unbelieving friends, they get like, why, 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 are, you, why are you weird? Like what, like, where else am I going? Where are you going? Hope you're going to see Jesus too. You know, I always have this thought, you know, my, we, Fisher and I we were talking about this the other day. He goes, you know, don't you ever think like one day we get stranded offshore and we're never getting back? And I go, yeah, I know. What would we do? And he's like, it'd be weird, wouldn't it? We'd just be sitting there waiting to go see Jesus. And we're talking about this with other people on the boat who are like unbelievers. And they're like, you guys are, you guys are weird. Why are you talking about this? And I'm like, well, because, you know, while whilst we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. And I said, we know that if this, this body, this little earthen body we have dissolves, which it's going to happen, we know that we have a home in heaven. Do you have a home in heaven? Man, I've just, lately, I've just kind of been like, you know, I just really don't care. Because as Paul says in the book of Galatians chapter 1, he says, um, I just want to read it to you because it's actually really, it, it, he actually says, do I now persuade men or God? Galatians 1 verse 10. <clears throat> For now do I persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? And here's the answer. For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So, in other words, when you preach the gospel, you're not going to necessarily be pleasing men. They're probably going to be a little bit offended at the offense of the cross. That's why he says, 
if, <coughs> if, for if yet I please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. He actually talks about earlier that the, that the offense of the cross has ceased. <coughs> Back to Romans 8, I want to read this to you because I really want you to get it. Romans 8, verse number 10. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Always, forever, we know that. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. This is now Paul taking the time to, to, to logically explain to you this with his deductive reasoning, if you would, right? And he says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, which, which he does, he that raised up Christ from the dead, notice this word, shall also really when you go to law school one of the first things you ever read or understand is that words are so important I have people ask me all the time you know one of the questions I get I got a guy the other day comes up to me goes hey I got a legal question for you I said okay go he goes all right so I got this this blah blah, blah uh, contract with this blah blah blah, blah. This. I said okay 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 well, what does the contract say well, I don't know. I said, well, you're going to have to go and read that. He goes, dude, it's like 75 pages long. And I go, did you sign it? He goes, yeah. I go, well, you're bound to it. And he goes, well, what if there's a part in there? I said, there's going to be a severability portion. You ever seen that in the contract? He's like, this is ridiculous. Why do you guys do this? I go, I don't blame me. I didn't write the contract. You asked me for some help. And he goes, well, what is this all about? I go, listen, you're going to have to read the contract because it says in here, shall. Oh. That's a must, not permissive. You don't have a choice. You're going to have to do that. So I'm going to have to pay him that money? Yeah, if you're going to terminate early, you have to pay it. Well, can't we litigate it? How much is it going to cost to litigate it versus just paying it? But either way, anyways, people don't look at the words that much because for the most part, you ever read anything? You sign up for a new, you get a new iPhone. You slide up, you hit, I agree. Did you know what you agreed to? No clue. You have no idea what you just signed up for. And that's unfortunately the way most people believe the gospel. This is what they do. I believe the gospel. Great. You have eternal life. Do you know any of the benefits that you got out of it? Nope. No clue about anything? Nope. Romans? What's that? Don't you think that's pretty accurate? That they would live their life, not even, they would just, I accept. Great. You accepted Christ as your Savior. Terrific. Wee. Now what? And, and, and they just live a life that's pretty meaningless. And I think the reality is they're going to get to heaven. And the joke that I, I love the joke of Russ. I think it's hilarious. You know? I'm Samuel. You ever read any of my books? Pretty funny. Pretty funny. Because you know, Samuel, who's that guy? He's got a lot to learn. So in Romans chapter 8, Paul says, <clears throat> But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, that's the whole big kicker is that Christ was raised from the dead. The whole issue of eternal life is that Christ was raised from the dead. He proved that there is no what? There's no restriction on his ability to conquer the one thing that's been haunting the world, which is death. So but if the, the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. <clears throat> How does he make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you? How does that occur? Well, you just got life. You weren't even alive before. Your mortal bodies now are made alive. He says, now look what he says. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Now notice that. He's just giving you the option here that it, it is going to occur. Read the book of 1 Corinthians and see how people live their life according to the flesh. Not very good. Paul finishes out the, the whole book of 1 Corinthians by saying, you know, dearly beloved, I do everything for your edification and not for your destruction. I want to build you up. In other words, what you're trying to do is you're taking the concepts that Paul has laid out in the book of Colossians. If you look at Colossians chapter number three, <coughs> you're taking that concept as he says in Colossians three verse one, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above 
where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And then you're going to go, well, you don't understand. I have a car payment. I have insurance. I have debt. I, yeah, I, yeah, I know. That's part of living in the sin-cursed world, okay? But at the same time, while you have all those things that are going on in your life, it's just like how Paul says, you're a servant? Care not for it. You don't worry about those things. Those things are a part are a part of life. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, or Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on earth. But I'm looking for all these blessings on earth. Well, you could do that. Or you could think about all the spiritual blessings and heavenly places that you have in Christ. Verse 3, it says, for ye are dead. Wait, what? I'm real confused. He just said that we're risen with Christ. How are you risen with Christ in the same time you're dead? Well, he, he rose you. That is, the portion of you that is not your flesh, he rose your what? Your spirit. So he says here, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Good, I like it. Keep hiding it there. Hide it there forever. I, I'm, I'm thankful that he hid, that your life is hid with Christ in God. What do you mean it's hid? It's controlled. It's protected. It's protected. He's he's got it. You know, as I read these verses, I can't think but just jumping back to the end of Romans chapter 8 for a second. <clears throat> Go back to the end of Romans 8. And he says this phrase in verse 5. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Christ. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. Nothing, as he says. As is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And this is where I want everybody to be. I want everybody to be persuaded. When Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall separate us, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I, I hope that you can just go back and you can read that and you put your head on the pillow and whatever the heck is going on in your life, you just go, I don't even care. It doesn't even matter. Because it doesn't. I'm serious. It doesn't. So take a second. In the midst of all your craziness of your life, because we all have it, nuts. We all sat here and go, no, no, well, let's have a crazy contest. Whose life's more crazy? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We all got some stuff going on, right? So then you sit there and you go, who shall separate us? Nothing. No one, not any person, nothing can separate us. So getting back over here to Romans 8, verse number 13, <coughs> for he says this. <coughs> for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. That's your whole life. If you just live after the flesh, good luck. That's a real, that's a real bad life. You're not going to have a lot of fun. You're not going to be very enjoyable. You're not going to have any peace. You're not going to have any happiness. You're not going to have any joy. And he says, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now I want to take these verses and we're going to spend some time looking at the phrases he uses. He uses the word reckon, mortify, let not, ye neither yield, depart from, and these are choices that we do get to make. Now this phrase in verse number 14 is where many people become a little bit spooky with this thing called the spirit. As it reads here, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If you have your dog on a leash, do you lead him? Not really. What is the concept of being led? There's a path. You know, I was out one time fishing, and sorry, all my examples are fishing, but I don't have a lot of other stuff. But I was out fishing one time, we were offshore. And it was super foggy. I'm talking like crazy foggy. And I did not have my, I don't have a radar on my boat. I have on my, on my 
current boat, I don't have radar. My new boat definitely has a radar. But this boat didn't have a radar. And you know what radar does? It lets you see through you know, the fog. You can see things. So I'm offshore. I don't know how many miles. A good, good distance. And uh, this fog is just rolling in and rolling in. <coughs> and I'm anchored up. And you can. what's always kind of scary is you can hear, <coughs> like a big ship coming through. And you're always kind of like, where's that coming from? You don't have the radar. A little spooky. And we're fishing for probably a couple hours. And it's getting later in the afternoon. <coughs> and all of a sudden, I look over my machine, my bottom machine, and my, which is my Navionics, all my maps and all my stuff. It's off. And I go, well, that's weird. Why is it off? I click the little power button. It doesn't turn on. I go, well, I got another one, so that's okay. I go up, up to my top, hit that button. It doesn't turn on either. And I go, well, this is just great. So, you know, I'm how many miles offshore, and I have a compass, but you know what? It was one of the first times I ever used my compass, and I go, well, never used this before. So my buddy and I look at each other, and we're, it's just me and my buddy Jeremy. We just look at each other, and we go, well, we're like, I don't know, 10, 15 miles offshore. You know, you can't see land. It's so foggy. You can't probably see from here to the fence, right? So I go, well, which way do we go? And it was real funny because I turned the boat. I, I, we pulled up our anchor. We finished catching our fish. I was like, do we have enough fish anyways? Let's just, let's just head in and we'll go flay them up. <clears throat> I'm pulling the anchor up, <clears throat> get it up, throwing the thing. I turn the boat on. I flip it over, and I start heading east. And he goes, you sure we're going the right way? <laughs> and I go, yeah, I'm, sh I'm positive. He goes, let me see it. And he wants to look at the, at the compass. And I go, I get it. I, I mean, I kind of want to look at the compass, too. I would want to make sure we're going the right way. And he looks at the compass, and he goes, okay, one, zero, one, eight, okay. Okay. I said, you okay? And he goes, yeah, I think we're going the right way. I said, you sure? And he goes, well, now you're making me second guess myself. It's east, right? And then he's, he's like, I'm picturing, the, I'm picturing America. East is that way. I'm like, dude, yes, east is that. We're fine. And he's like, okay, well, let's, let's start heading back. So I said, we're just going to go due east because we know we're not going to try to go northeast or anything. <coughs> we ended up coming back, and because we were so far south, we didn't see land for a little while. And I was like, man, it's kind of weird. We're really, really due east. We keep, we keep going, keep going. I, I'm kind of like keeping track of how fast I'm going with how many miles I'm going. And I'm like, I said, if we can find any of the cans run into the channel, we'll be okay because cans are every mile going out for the first 20 miles to, out of Tampa Bay. So I said, if we can find one of the cans – then we're good. So we're driving, we're driving. We're not seeing any cans. And I'm starting to go, ah. He goes, you sure it's east? So anyways, long story short, we end up finding one can, you know, and I go, okay, that's a can. And we had to head, head the cans back in. But you could not see the mile. Usually you can see the can. You know, it's pretty easy to see a mile to a mile to a mile to a mile and, you know, running the cans back. <clears throat> but being led by the Spirit <coughs> is in a very similar way. In other words, you see things in a different light. You maintain a mindset that is completely spiritual about all of these things. That, that you're, not being, you're not being pulled in a direction, but that you're being led. That God is showing you through the scripture. That God is showing you through the peace that passes all understanding. That, that the spirit of God, which you possess, he writes here, for as many as are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. See, being led by the spirit also gives you a, a multi multitude of benefits one of which is in, Rome, uh, is in Galatians chapter 5, in which he says that they that are led by the Spirit, as he writes here, notice this in verse 18. But if ye, let, if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. <laughs> what? But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not underneath the law. Well, that's the whole thing we're just talking about. If you read verse number 17, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, <coughs> and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so you cannot do the things that ye would. They're in opposition. Back to Romans 8 and verse number 14 and 15, and we got to finish this up here in about a minute. He says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The concept of being led is like having a key or a legend, if you would. You ever try to build a puzzle and not have the actual box? Pretty hard to do. It's nice to see the whole map of everything that goes on. I, uh, there's 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 things that, that you hear in your life that you don't forget. I told Sandy one of them this morning. I said, you know, w one lady, a friend of mine said, yeah, you just got to remain unaffected. You know, stuff happens in your life, remain unaffected. One of the things that uh, Frank's always said that's always stuck with me is nothing ever occurs to God. 
And, you know, at first I was like, what are you talking about? That's, so that's a Frankism. If I've ever heard of Frankism, right? And then you got to go home, you got to digest it a little bit, and you go, ah, that's pretty profound. Yeah, nothing ever does occur to God, right? And he writes here, for you have not received, notice this, you do not receive the spirit of bondage again to, what's the word? Fear. So that's the whole, that's, that's, the mo that's the majority of the world, that they live with a spirit of bondage, a spirit of fear. <clears throat> he says, no, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. This spirit that we possess, Paul says in uh, 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy, chapter 1, I believe, in verse number 7, that he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of peace and love and of a sound mind. Now, let's, let's preface this by saying, you're not always going to possess that sound mind. You're not always going to possess that peace, but you go back to it. You go back to it. You go back to it, right? And because that's, that's what the map is, the map shows you. He says, well, yeah, you just, <laughs> you're over here on that course. What's that course? Well, that's the course of the world. Well, what's that do? <laughs> that just ends some bad stuff. You don't want to be on that. Okay, I get it. You're not, you're not on this path of eternal life as if you're somehow, you just go back to what, what God has for you in the sense of who you are in Christ Jesus. As he writes here, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So what's the opposite of the fear then? Isn't fear a feeling? You ever been afraid? Yeah. So when you say things like, oh, I can't have a feeling. Well, no, you, you definitely have a feeling of, of relief. But what is a feeling? What is joy and peace? Isn't that a feeling? Most definitely. So can you have joy and peace in believing? Yes. The fear that he says here is gone because you've received the spirit of adoption you know the process of adoption is is pretty awesome uh i have a friend of mine who just adopted two kids and i would have thought in my life if you were to say okay here's here's a list of your friends and <clears throat> pick the one that adopted kids and put it in order from you know one to twenty uh this guy would probably be at the end of the list okay he adopted two kids and i thought to myself i said yeah wow it's pretty awesome what i asked him about i said how what did that transpire even though you were thinking about doing that he goes well you know we were talking about it. We were going to help do some fostering because there was some kids in our church that needed some help. And I just decided, yeah, let's go ahead and foster some kids. I got these two kids, two brothers. And, you know, next thing I know, I'm adopting them. I go, well, why? He goes, how could I not? I said, I, 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 I have the money, I have the ability. And they were going to take the kids and probably split them up. And I was like, huh. and he's like, that's what I did. I was like, I can't let them do it. I, I, I got I to gotta adopt them. But that adoption process, for those little kids, they won't even know anything different. You know, they're so young, three and four years old, they'll never know that their that their parents were, you know, drug addicts and strung out. But <clears throat> they do know that they have a father and that that father is as real to them as any other father. In other words, to them, le legally speaking, that father can do everything. He they, they It's called a severing of your parental rights. So what your adoption to God, and I'm going to end with this, is that he severs your your parental rights to satan think about that he severs the parental rights nope not anymore you got no control because he says that they're that you were by nature the children of what of wrath so what does he do he adopts you and he takes you out of that position of being a child of wrath and he puts you into christ jesus which is his only begotten son the one and only Christ Jesus, and he takes him and he says, you are equal with the Lord Jesus Christ in terms of how righteous you are. And you go, hey, what? Not going not gonna to make you earn it. Now, these good works that we're going to look through these next couple weeks, I really want you to focus on these next couple verses <clears throat> because there's going to be a suffering that takes place in this, in this earth. And I think what we're always concerned about is, is the number of the good works. Like we're like, you know, Paul says that we, we should be zealous of good works, that we should be careful to maintain good works for, for, for good, you know, for purposes, because this is good and this is profitable for men. <clears throat> but there's a thing about trying to, like, we got to make a number system, then they turn it into, like, a law-based system, and that just becomes ridiculous, right? 
you know, one of the best good works you can do mm-hmm. is tell people about the good work that hath begun in you, which is Jesus Christ. So I can, uh, I can assure you that my conversation with Eric the other day is a good work, and I can assure you that the conversation that we had with Eric the other day will go to the judgment seat of Christ and it will not burn up. Okay? That, will, that, will, that right there, gold, silver, precious stone. Is that some motivation? I think it's motivation. Dollars in bank accounts? You know, Frank also said this one one time. He goes, I got so many Frankisms. I'm sorry. Just, you know, Frank and I have a lot of discussions. He said, yeah, your bank account? It, it's like a, it, it, what do you say? It's like a bowl with a hole in it. You just got to keep putting water in it. It's like just keeps dripping. It's just your whole life. You just keep, keep filling it up, right? It leaks. And then you think about what you have with Christ Jesus. It just overflows. It doesn't stop. As you start to read more about this, Paul says, you become more and more and more convinced of the truth. You become more and more and more persuaded. I hope you can get to that point in your life that you get to the point of persuasion, absolute persuasion. My dad was sick this past week. He was in the hospital, had his gallbladder out, had like sepsis and all kinds of stuff going on. And yeah, it was horrible. So it was all like nasty. And I'm like, you know, my dad sends me pictures of his gallbladder. And I'm like, (coughs) my dad, that thing looks disgusting. (coughs) That thing is all gangrenous. And like, you can just look at it. I'm like, I told my dad, I'm like, dad, this didn't happen overnight. And he's like, well, you know, it's, I've had a little bit of pain. I'm like, dude, before you get crazy, you should probably go ahead and take care of that stuff. But, you know, right before my dad went to surgery, I asked him, I said, do you want me to pray with you? And he said, yes, please. Right? And, you know, even though it's a minor surgery, you know, I told him, I said, you know, you make it, great. You don't make it, it's even better. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I, I just throw that out there. I make that joke. And, you know, my dad, my dad goes, yeah, yeah, you know what? You're right. It is better. So, you know, he went into it. And, uh, you know, when he comes out, I'm like, you made it. Yeah, I made it. You know, kind of a little bit saddened. So, you know, to be absent is be present. And I want to give you that. But, you know, also there's a, there's a lot of peace in this life that you can get in being persuaded that nothing can separate you from the love of, of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, is very important. So we'll pick up this here next week. And uh, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, always we should.